Hi and welcome, my name is Lawrence Baker and today I'm going to be doing panoramic photography using Lightroom. Firstly, I'm going to go out into the field to give you a few tips and then I'm going to come back into Lightroom. Now, panoramic photography is very straightforward in my opinion. It can be made more complicated by using things like the nodal point of the lens, N-O-D-A-L, or the parallax of a lens. I suggest you don't delve into that because it isn't really necessary. There's a few rules about shooting in manual mode and it helps to use a tripod, obviously. Now, if you haven't got a tripod, it's still possible to do panoramic shots. And people do pretty good panoramic shots with iPhones, for instance. But the best way to do this with a camera or with an iPhone or any phone for that matter, is to rotate it on your thumb because you're emulating a tripod. Shooting in manual is very important, but I've known people who shoot in program mode or automatic mode and have not had any problems. Don't use a circular polarizer, that can cause problems. Again, I've known people to leave their circular polarizer on and have no problems. But you know, I'll give you these rules when we get out into the field. Now I'm going to a place called the Long Stone, which is a Neolithic stone um, near where I live on the Isle of Wight, W-I-G-H-T, off the south coast of England. Let's get started. After junction 23, which is where the M4 and M48 sort of converge, near Mega. So on the eastbound carriageway we've got two lanes out of action, and finally the A13 I'm stood here in front of Modstone Manor. There's two film connections. That church hosted the wedding last year of Benedict Cumberbatch because his wife's family used to own this house here. So there's one film connection there. The other one is one of the previous occupants, Major Jack Seeley, was known locally as Galloper Jack. He owned a horse called Warrior who served with him in the First World War. And it was the idea behind the book Warhorse, which subsequently became a film and quite a good play as well. So I'm going to make my way to the downs or hills behind the house to do some panoramic shots. Let's get going. As you can see here, the bluebells have come out. Now they only last another couple of weeks and it's only once a year. They get shot a lot by photographers and I'm no different because I love seeing them and I won't see them again for another year. So, as I say, it's a cliche shot, but I'm going to take some bluebell photographs, probably a little bit higher up. This seems like a good place for a close-up shot of some bluebell. So, as I said, it's a cliche shot, but I'm still going to do it. of panoramic photography are, you must obviously have a tripod and it must be level. Don't worry too much about the rule of thirds or whatever because the horizon is going to change across the shot. I try and capture a little bit more sky than I need because I do like the rule of thirds when I crop. Now, there's something called the nodal point or the parallax of your lens. I would say ignore them. Now the nodal point has been proved to be wrong now. Parallax of your lens could be important if you've got very strong, very close foreground subjects. But on this occasion, I don't think it will really matter. I'm shooting uh, in manual mode because you have to be in manual mode. You have to set the ISO and shutter speed yourself. And more importantly, you have to have manual focus on because if you don't, you'll have problems with stuff being out of focus and in focus. So what you're trying to do is get continuity across all the shots. So try and shoot in manual mode. If you're a bit worried about it and can't get it right, we'll shoot an automatic, but be prepared for some strange results. So if, above all, try and manually focus. And once you've manually focused in, just let the camera do the rest of the work. 
Now I'm shooting with a quite a narrow aperture because this is a landscape shot and I want the background to be in focus. So I'm shooting with f16, I might even go higher to f22. I have got a wide angled lens and I'll probably have to profile correct or definitely profile correct inside of Lightroom because um, there'll be some barrel distortion and obviously you don't want the whole image to be barrel distorted. Um, when I get into Lightroom, I'll explain that you'll have to do each shot manually, i.e. set the lens correction on it, because if you don't, you will have problems. Now, some people say don't use a wide angle lens. I say it's fine, but just remember, you should have your lens supported in Lightroom. If not, you'll have problems. Most people will shoot with a 35 mil or a 50 mil. Personally, I don't really care. Anything below 21 mil would be a bit ridiculous because you're already getting a panoramic shot with a fisheye lens, so it's not really relevant. So the, the golden points or the golden rules are, shoot in manual mode, manually focus, Set the ISO and shutter speed yourself because you're going to have to. Now, the way I do it is I shoot an aperture priority first on the aperture I'm going to use, see what the shutter speed's like and say, well, that will be fine for me. ISO 100 would be fine for today. It's a bit dark now, but you know, on a normal day, uh, 100 would be fine. 400 would be the maximum I would go to because I don't want noise. Also, uh, obviously tripod, steady, etc., and just take your shots. Now, if you're right in manual mode, I said, then just do it in a program mode, but do manually focus in. That's it, guys, really. Well, here I am all set up, tripod, rucksack, weighing it down. It's very simple, you just take the shots and move the camera around. I make my shots as wide as I possibly can because I'm going to crop them in, so it gives me more choice. As I say, I think panoramic shots are very straightforward in my personal opinion. Well, here we are inside of Lightroom. Make sure you're in sort by capture time A to Z, so the time is increasing left to right. I like to see all my images on one line, i.e. the five images I'm going to use. So you can use the equals key or the minus key to make the grid larger and smaller. Also, I like to have the time showing Command J Depending on the view you're in, compact cells or expanded cells. Uh, compact cells, make sure capture date and time is showing there. Expanded cells, make sure capture date and time is showing there. So you have it in both, you can't go far wrong. So I'm happy with my images. I need to correct my lens. If I didn't, I would select the five images now and go to photo, photo merge, panorama. But I need to correct my lenses. I recommend you do so. Uh, if your lens is supported. If it isn't, skip this step. To select the images, select the first one, shift click on the last one, press D on your keyboard, enter the develop module, you only see the first image, but you can see in the film strip they're all selected. F6 will turn that film strip off, F6 will turn it back on. Lens corrections. Uh, I have this done automatically for my images because it's the default profile, but you know, to be on the safe side, you should do this. I'll untick it now under profile to show you what it does to the image. It gets rid of the barrel distortion. There's my lens supported. Under basic, make sure you got remove chromatic aberration because you have more than one image selected. The sync button will be available to you. If you wanted to, you could have had auto sync on and done the changes. I prefer just the normal sync method, which requires me to click on it now and it ticks everything, but that's not a problem because the only changes I've done are lens profile and chromatic aberration. Synchronize, photo, photo merge, panorama. And I bring up the preview box. These are projections, spherical, cylindrical, and perspective. So try and think of it being projected onto that surface. So with a spherical, which I'm gonna click on now, it's projecting it onto the inside of a sphere. So it's usually an algorithm that works on the inside of a sphere. The problem is it, it creates more distortion top and bottom, but it allows you to use the boundary warp a little bit better. And I'll show you what that means now. Untick auto crop. And if you just start playing around with this, you can bring the boundaries of the photo out to meet the edge of the canvas, but you are distorting the image. Spherical is for very wide panoramas, uh, very big ones. It doesn't really help you on panoramas like this, which are 180 degrees. So cylindrical is my choice, 
Auto crop is my next choice. If I go to perspective, it's not going to work because there's not enough straight lines in the image for it to work. It's for buildings only, take my word for it. So cylindrical is fine for this type of panorama. You can play around with boundary warp, but we don't have time. Merge. Now it obviously won't show up except in a film strip once it's done. If you haven't got your film strip on, just go back to the grid and find it, then go back into the develop module because you want to develop it as normal. Now, once the dialog box disappears, it's showing up in the film strip already here. As I said, if you don't have your film strip on, go back to the grid and find it. But, you know, you can find it in the film strip to save yourself a little bit of time. My first port of call will always be my crop, R on my keyboard for crop. It's far too wide in my personal opinion for my taste. So I'm going to bring it right in. I like the rule of thirds, that's the overlay showing at the moment. You can cycle through it by pressing O on your keyboard and find the golden spiral, etc, etc, and press Shift O to move it around the screen. Well, actually, there's where the golden spiral is, so I could use that if I wanted to. So that's just a little bit of a heads up there. Um, so if I moved through the, the options and get to the rule of thirds again, well, actually, it's not too bad. So I might stay with that and now press Return to get rid of the crop. Basic... Um, develop here, auto, auto, a bit of clarity, a bit of vibrance, tiny lack of saturation, graduated filter, keep the shift key pressed, I used M on my keyboard to get the filter up by the way, quite a way down because I think this is far too bright, right, make it a little bit bluer, take some, uh, too dark, take some of it off, that's not too bad, little bit less blue some clarity to give a little bit of punch to the sky um tiny amount of dehaze um yeah that's fine now if i was getting really fussy i could paint away the effect on that stone but we don't have time for that um basically i'm going to sharpen it very quickly um i would say sh use the masking slider first with the alt or option key pressed so you can see what you're doing um, grayscale is very important when it comes to sharpening. What's black won't be sharpened, what's white will be sharpened, depending on the shades of grey in between. So I want the down sharpened, the hills in the background, the stone definitely. Don't want too much of the messy foreground sharpened. That's about right at about 85. Now really you should be in one-to-one -one view here. If I press F7 I get the left hand side panel and I'm cu currently going between fit and four to one, so I need to click on one to one to make sure that I'm zooming in properly. So I'm in the wrong place on the, on the image, hand symbol to bring it over to, I could use the navigator as well, by the way, if I wanted to. So that's my one to one view. I want to see that stone in the foreground. Alt or option key pressed. Amount is about finding edges. It's like an edge detection tool. The more you move it to the right, the more edges it will bring in. It will bring in the obvious edges first, like the edge of this stone. So you keep dragging it and start bringing in about right for me. Radius, as you will see, is the width of the luminosity around the pixels. So it shows up really well on a hard edge. You can see that white line going around the edge of that boulder. And I would say at about that, I'm quite okay. I'm not really introducing any noise, so I'm doing quite well here. So I'm having quite a lot of sharpening take place. Detail slider is the ugliest slider in the world on an image like this, because it's about the finer detail. That's the high frequency detail inside that boulder. And I think uh, for a landscape, it can ruin it. So and for a macro shot, it's absolutely fine. So I'm taking it to zero and that's the sharpening done. Z on my keyboard to come out, uh, shift tab to lose my side panels. I actually F8 again because I don't want the graduated filter showing. So it's shift tab again to lose all the panels. Uh, F on my keyboard to make it uh, full screen, though it was full screen anyway. I could play around with lights out and stuff like that. But hey, guys, I think that's pretty good. I didn't get rid of the tripod shadow, but I would have done that with the heel tool, I have a spot removal tool as Lightroom like to call it. So I would have got rid of that and um, I haven't done that. But overall, it's not that bad and it's that straightforward. Lens corrections, I definitely do. But if you don't want to or your lens is not supported, just select the images and go straight to Photo Merge Panorama. That's it, guys. I hope you got something from this. I really am getting into panoramas. I used to make a lot of mistakes. You know, they, they didn't come out very well. And it's about your tripod, really, and making sure that's level. And don't overlap too much because you'll get bored if you, you spend hours trying to get stuff stitched together. 
So, you know, to me, five shots is fine for the average panorama. If you're going wider, go wide, but make sure you've got good subject matter. For most of us, the arms out to the side panorama, which is 180 degrees, is absolutely fine. As I say, that tripod's annoying me. I could have got rid of that really easily, but I won't waste your time now. That's it, guys. Thanks very much.